Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the From Adversity to Abundance podcast. I am your host, Jamie Bateman, and I'm super excited today. We have a special guest on, Stephen Libman. He's a managing partner of Integrity Holdings Group. Stephen, how are you doing today? Good, Jamie. Thanks for having me on, man. Appreciate it. At, absolutely. I know you are uh, got your own show, so uh, you're a pro at this and should be a you know, you, you, I'm, I'm hoping you, I'm thinking you'll make it easy on me. So <laughs> I'll take it easy. No, no worries. No, I, I actually really appreciate the, um, the title and the concept behind this, because I think all the time we're so results focused. We're so, yeah. uh, in this results focused culture of, Oh, look, here's the result of all this hard work. But what we don't talk about is the ad, you know, the adversity that you're overcoming the day to day, the, the daily in and out. Yeah. And then we get this hyper results focused mentality. And when people start out or they try to do something and they're not immediately successful, they get discouraged and that's just yeah. not reality. So appreciate. No, absolutely. It. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't believe in overnight successes. I mean, uh, <laughs> so I think you're absolutely right. And, and, you know, we're going to highlight a, a good bit of that adversity that you've been through, but before we get there, let's, let's talk about some of the results just to, uh, understand for the listener out there so they can understand who you are and what you're up to today and, and, uh, you know, why we should listen to you. Yeah. So, I mean, my, my real estate career has spanned just about 12 years before that I was actually a real estate broker. So a little bit longer, but the investing side of the business of integrity holdings group has been about 12 years and we did not have two nickels to rub together when we started and we started wholesaling some property. So if you don't know what that is, it's essentially putting a property under contract, selling that contract to somebody who's going to go and do the work and you make a small arbitrage fee. So whether that be five, 10, 15,000, we've made 250,000 on those deals. But um, <clears throat> so we started wholesaling and then we started building a business that would um, take the top 20% of those deals and, and flip them. And over a seven or eight year period of time, we flipped about a thousand houses and building those systems was interesting and brutal in their own right. Um, the first five years, we didn't get over 15 deals a year. So, hmm. you know, it was a slow building process and learning in the first couple of years. And um, then we got into a, a rhythm where we were doing 10, 15, 20 deals a month and nice. um, getting killed in taxes. Highly <laughs> transactional business. Sure. Very expensive in terms of marketing. And this is just flipping you're talking about, not just wholesale, flipping, but wholesale and, flip. and flipping. Got yeah. it. Yeah. And, um, you know, between federal and state, we were paying upwards of 50% in in taxes. And a buddy of mine said, hey, you know, you should do a multifamily deal or a commercial project because there's some significant tax benefits to doing commercial projects. And I, I said, well, I, I don't know if that's true. So let me go read the tax code and find out. And sure enough, mm -hmm. he was right. <laughs> um, yeah. So we built about... I told him he was right. <laughs> I did. I said, hey, you were right. But he already knew that because his tax yeah. returns were already showing him that he was right. Got um, it. So it, that that year we did some wholesales and flips and uh, we built about 390,000 square feet of self-storage in uh, Orlando. So three facilities okay. managed by Cube Smart, ground up construction. Wow. Um, and the year after that, after they all got brought into service, we paid zero taxes, right? My tax return was like negative $430,000. And I said, wow, there is something <laughs> to this. Sure. And then That's we awesome. bought um, <clears throat> about 1,000 units in various markets, smallest one being 66 units, the largest one being in that time frame about 384 units. Okay. Um, These are all just, multifamily? All multifamily. Properties. Yep. Mm. And so apartment complexes, we've done some student housing as well. So a couple of those are student housing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, so we launched a $100 million equity fund after funding a bunch of those deals on a deal by deal basis, syndication wise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, recently we've launched a $100 million fund. And just in December, we closed um, just about another thousand 50 doors or so. So we would close a 984 unit complex in December and hmm. another 84 wow. unit complex as well. So yeah, that deal was a $257 million project. Wow. Um, so very, yeah, very to... large institutional style type yeah. projects that we're focusing on now. Equity checks between 10 and 40 million is really the sweet spot that we're in now. 
Wow. That's quite, quite different from uh, being a, a realtor and maybe doing a, a couple of uh, wholesale different deals wholesaling. That's true. <laughs> here and yes. there. So yeah, I'd love to dive into that as we get back to this, this uh, toward the end of the show. Um, I forgot to mention one reason I wanted to have you on was you and I separately chose the, uh, the, the, uh, part, our, our fund name, uh, as integrity, it's very similar. So we have, I've got two much smaller, uh, funds, mortgage note funds, uh, both named integrity, integrity, mortgage note fund, and the integrity income fund, uh, very different from what you have going on. Uh, but you know, that was one thing I think I, I pointed out to you a few months ago. I, I, it's one thing that attracted me to you. I like your, your, uh, choice in uh <laughs> naming of your company is is the fund called integrity or is it is that just the larger holding group yeah so um the <clears throat> it's the investing with purpose opportunity fund right okay. so we talk about investing with purpose a lot in terms of how we utilize the wealth from that business to fund nonprofits i think yeah. that's what it's called there's a couple like different funds right the donor advised fund i think might be investing with purpose and then this is Integrity Holdings Opportunity Fund One. Got so it. Okay. I'm sure we'll have a dozen or so <laughs> different, different <laughs> funds. Yeah. How'd you come up with your name? The Integrity. I just, uh, you know what? It was uh, so the the first one was the non performing note fund, and I um, yeah, I started. It I had some help from a business partner of mine. To it was my first fund, but it was his sixth or seventh fund, Chris Seventy, and. Really, it was just a matter of thinking of hey, what's what's a, a principle or value that's it's very important to both of us, uh, both Chris and and me, and that was it. I mean, now come to find out, you know, I'm not the only one who thought of it. <laughs> Obviously, you know, what's but, interesting, I don't know if this is true for you, but we took some heat when we named our company. Oh, is that right? No, I didn't. <clears throat> How so? Because well, I think people thought we were doing it kind of to make us seem like we had integrity. Mm -hmm. And so people would be like, Oh, you know, that's kind of, you don't need to say you have integrity if you actually sure. have it. I have heard that too. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. And for me, what my response was always was, well, it just, it's not there for you. It's there for me. It's, it's <laughs> remind me who we are sure. and who we work for. Right. So the, the Absolutely. basis of that was based on Proverbs 10, nine, which says, Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. And that has like that's the scripture for us that's attached to the the word integrity. And you know, uh -huh. I think it's it's a heavy that's burden great. to bear when you point sure. to yourself as being a person of integrity, and that's the yeah. scripture that you have to live by, right? So yeah, and I and uh, a couple things come to mind, and then we'll jump into your your backstory. But um, you know, one is if you're growing. In, and having enough success, you're going to have some haters. <laughs> so, you know, sure. that's probably a good sign that, that you got, you have people that were upset with you about the name. Um, and then secondly, certainly in the mortgage note space, and I, and I know in the, the broader real estate investing space, you know, you can't trust everybody. And we've got some, uh, unfortunately, some bad apples. And, and uh, so I think uh, the world writ large could use more integrity. Um, I'll just put it that way. So let's jump into your, your backstory and, um, obviously focus on, you know, some of the adversity that you've been through on a, on a personal and or business level. Um, and then we'll try to pull out some, some lessons learned and, and bring it back up to today. Um, so where would you like to start? I mean, I think it's always good to start at the beginning and kind of figure sure. out what fuels that fire in most of us as entrepreneurs, right? Or people that are looking for financial freedom or other freedom, maybe that's attached to it. Um, <clears throat> so I was born, um, I turned 40 this year, so born in 82. Nice. And um, I was born to essentially an absent father. He left when I was uh, just a couple months old. And was raised by a single mother. So my mom had already been divorced at that time. So I had a half brother that lived with me. And um, and then I was born and she got divorced again, unfortunately. So <clears throat> when I was five, I got adopted. So it's interesting. If you guys are watching the video, you probably can't tell. Some of my beard has turned white. But <laughs> I have a Jewish last name. And this, this is what Irish, you have to look forward to. This. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
and a very, very Irish look to me, right? But I have a Jewish last name and um and the reason for that is because I was uh, adopted when I was five or six. Okay. Um, so that's how I got my last name. So my mom was still in the picture. I, my parents got um, married and eventually they got divorced as well. So three hmm. divorces in my lifetime by the time I was 12 from just wow. my mom's side. That's right? a lot. <laughs> my dad, <clears throat> who adopted me, who I consider my father, right? The, the other guy hmm. was kind of checked out and gone by the time I was just a baby. So, um, my dad who raised me, he was previously married as well. Mm. Right. So you're talking, you know, five divorces essentially by the time I was 12 between these two parents, five divorces and adoption and a biological father who abandoned you. I mean, if we're, you know, right. Exactly. So, I mean, that's a ton of instability, uh, in a very vulnerable uh, time period for for you. Yeah. And in your formative years, you don't know that that's unstable, right? That's all you sure. know. Sure. So what's interesting about that is you kind of just think that, okay, this happens. Other people's parents stay together. Other people's parents get divorced too, but this is just kind of the, the life. Um, the, the blessing that came out of that is that my dad provided us with uh, more financial security than we ever had in, in the past, <laughs> which gave us the security to stay into a, one home throughout my entire life, going to <laughs> similar school districts my entire life, <clears throat> growing up with similar friends, so I wasn't moved around a bunch. So that was um, the stability that I needed or that I got from mm -hmm. that situation. and. Sure. You know, so I say all that because during that time, my grandfather on my dad's side was um, the only entrepreneur in the family. So my dad was one of five. My mom was one of five as well. Um, and they only had one entrepreneur in the family. And he mm -hmm. started a, um, a tire business and ended up selling that to a large national conglomerate and did very well. <laughs> and We'd go visit them down in Florida and see them living mm -hmm. on the golf course and go into the club for lunch and mm -hmm. kind of piqued my interest a little bit to figure out, wow, how, how does life look so different between generations, right? My dad, God rest his soul, he um, never had that entrepreneurial spirit. He mm -hmm. would always do jobs that were pretty safe. Mm -hmm. and held on to money pretty tight because I think he was afraid of losing it because he didn't know how to earn it. So, you know, even at a young age, I was sitting here going, man, how do you go from one generation of mm -hmm. entrepreneurship, let's start this, let's go after it, to the next level, which is um, not really entrepreneurial. And there was one or two that were entrepreneurial, but overwhelmingly they weren't, mm -hmm. and going... All right. So what was the difference there? And then how do we uh, want our life to look? Right. So um, I think even after my dad left when I was uh, 12 or 13, I saw some financial instability from my mom. Right. She had to work full time and take care of the kids in the house. And I stayed with her. And, um, you know, she was a rock star, essentially having to go out and be the breadwinner and um, I'm sure she got support, but at 12 years old, you don't see that, right? You see one parent working mm -hmm. and everything that was provided for you. And, um, and for me, I was like, man, I don't want that. I don't want sure. this level of stress when bills come in. And, um, you know, I think that's kind of what started planting the seed. So, you know, as we talk about adversity, I don't think you could talk about adversity without what what benefit comes out of it and what lessons Absolutely. we learned from it. Um, and I think that for me was what planted the seed of entrepreneurship is those kind of that, that whole formative year experience, all of those years going, okay, so there is this other way of life that I see. Right. right. And then there's right. this uh, struggle and instability over here, but how do we avoid that? And is that just purely by chance or is that tactical and intentional? And I get to determine what path I take. Sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, it's been a, a common theme with, with uh, many of the guests on the show so far is just being able to pull out those, the, uh, the blessings that came along with the adversity. And, um, you know, maybe you, I think, I think what you're alluding to is maybe you wouldn't be 
a successful real estate investor and entrepreneur today had you not seen uh, dealt with adversity, financial adversity uh, firsthand, and then also you know kind of seen both sides of it. Um, so had you been you know born into a wealthy family, maybe you you know maybe you would have been more like your your dad and played it safe, right? I mean, I, I don't know. Um, maybe I don't think any <laughs> of us can really tell the story backwards, right? We just know no. kind of how the dominoes all started to fall, and absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think all of those things, a culmination of all of those things tend to lead you towards the path that we all end up taking. Yeah, so 12 years old, your your uh, father at that point left through divorce, and then if I understand correctly, and um, walk us through uh, uh, from there uh, on, walk, uh, what were some of the challenges you dealt with after 12 years old? Yeah. So my brother at the time was six years older than me. So he moved out of the house. So it was just me and my mom and, you know, playing Pop Warner football and going into high school. And I was, I was a really uh, buttoned up kid. I was playing hockey and tennis and football and was a straight A student was in theater and school paper. And, um, and I think in hindsight, right. And I'm sure if you interview a bunch of entrepreneurs, we could probably tend to agree that you become this overachiever because you feel maybe a little less than a little bit less, um, like you have to prove it to somebody, sure. right. Especially I think going through the abandonment issues that I was still mentally going through as a child mm -hmm. going, okay, so what is it that I can do to make myself feel better? Like I'm achieving to this level that, um, gives me this yeah. validity or yeah. Yeah. Right. So the, to, yeah, exactly. I, I think that validation that you're looking for externally. Sure. And I think, um, you know, I, I've heard a couple of our investors who are very, very successful talk mm -hmm. about this where they have this crippling insecurity and mm -hmm. that's what's made them <laughs> supremely successful. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think, um, there's a couple of things that make that are uh, like precursors to success. And one is this, um, I think I can do it better than you, which is <laughs> this kind of prideful sure. way to look at it, but you do right. kind of need a certain level of, I think I can do it better. Um, and then conversely, which is very interesting, the, <laughs> I have this crippling insecurity that I'll never be enough. Right. And the dichotomy of those two things kind of present a level of success that I think most entrepreneurs have not all, but if you read a lot of psychological studies, that is kind of one of the only predictors of what makes people massively successful. So I think going through both of those things at the same time made me go in into high school and say, okay, I'm going to go do really well. Right. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so lettered in a bunch of varsity sports, was a straight A student, got into uh, Boston University, which was kind of my reach school at the time. Nice. And then I went away and fell apart, essentially. Hmm. Had no real guardrails, had no real friends. And I'd say my freshman year of, of college, I, um, I did okay. It was a big shock to the system going from being top of your class at some no name suburban high school to mm -hmm. now being in a very affluent and, mm -hmm. um, you know, very high achieving school status where sure. I think the average SAT when I got into BU was like 14 and a half mm -hmm. or 1450 or something like that. And wow. it was like the first day they told us, Hey, you were all straight A students, everybody in this class. Right. So right. just by definition, somebody's going to start to be average. And sure, somebody's going to be below average. So if you think about that, if you have all of these top achieving students that all come in and now you have a new bell curve that's created, there's going to be really high achievers and then there's going to be middle of the pack. And there's going to be, I tended to fall uh, that first semester into the lower probably quarter of that Got it. grouping. Now, let me um, ask you this. Did you have, were you playing sports in college? No. So I actually did go out and try and, you know, to play hockey at Boston university is very, very That's high level. So sure. um, yeah. I did walk on and tried to go skate with those kids, but they're the best of the best. So that sure. didn't work out. Okay. Um, 
the so, reason I asked was not to point out a you know failure, but just <laughs> to point out that that I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of kids get to college and now they've got all this free time, especially if they don't have athletics like they were used to having. It sounds like in high school you didn't have a lot of free time to go screw Do things off. up. Exactly. <laughs> right. And that's right. And so then in college, you didn't make the the team, right? And and that wasn't the point, but you don't, ha- now you've got all this free time, right? Yeah. And so it's, what did we do? We decided, yeah. hey, I'm going to take all these college courses. I, I had to work full time. So okay. I worked through school and then I partied like a rock star, right? I joined a fraternity <laughs> and I decided that, you know, now I can rip the wheels off. Um, and my first year didn't get good grades, was put on probation academically and then pulled it together my sophomore junior year would still um you know and worked full time so i mean mm-hmm. there was a lot of good that came out of college i worked full time mm-hmm. i had dedication i got i ended up graduating with like a 3 4 gpa um nice. and no student loans right so i would i worked full time and paid the second most expensive school in the country at the time along the way wow. so <clears throat> so there there was there was that Right. Sure. I also figured out how to do that while partying pretty hard. <laughs> and I say that would probably lead me to stage two of like the life mapping moments of adversity, um, which was I called shotgun on the way home from a bar late at night from a guy that I knew relatively well, but my buddy got in the back seat. I got in the front seat. And uh, as he dropped us off, a bunch of cop cars dropped down on us. I mean, from every direction that you could think of the whole. So in Boston, all the lights are blue, right? Mm. Depending on where you are in the country. Mm -hmm. So so this Mm -hmm. was all blue. So the whole street lit up in blue. And I was like, what is going on here? And sure enough, this guy had a car full of all kinds of illegal narcotics. And my my uh, buddy, who's actually mm-hmm. going to come and visit me this week, I haven't seen him in a while, but he was in the back seat. They let him go home and they charged me with everything they charged the driver with, which ended up being um, six or seven felonies and about 15 misdemeanors. And they didn't send me to the drunk tank. They put me in Nashua State Penitentiary in Boston. Wow. Um, and at 22, that was the scariest moment. I, of can, my life. I can only imagine. And this is, <clears throat> was strictly be, the, the reason for the difference in treatment between you and your buddy in the back was simply that you'd called shotgun and you were sitting in the front seat. So I could reach all the things in his glove box. And that's kind of what they determined to be the reason that I could get charged. And he was in the back and he had no access. So they just sure. said, Hey, so, um, oh. needless to say, I don't call shotgun anymore. <laughs> um regardless of where we're going or who's driving um <clears throat> but i ended up spending a couple of days in uh a, a, you know essentially a state penitentiary like mm-hmm. full brown jumpsuit with doc printed on the back like you know no no shoelaces no like you know strip search the whole thing um and i i didn't come out of that jail cell it was the the guard took pity on me as we were going up stairs and uh did not put me with a cellmate which i am eternally grateful for <laughs> because the guys that were in there are there serving real time they weren't you know this was a county county jail so you had some hardened criminals in there 20 25 years um sentences wow. So what, anyway, what ended up happening in the, through the legal system? Yeah. So long you? story short, everything got dropped, right? I mean, we had, yeah. I sure. had to spend a couple thousand dollars on a, on a, on a decent attorney who could go and say, Hey, this is nonsense. Mm-hmm. During all of that though, I almost got kicked out of school because the police report read what the police report read. So they were waiting to see what happened in the legal system before allowing me to walk and graduate. Um, so stressful time, right? Sure. And it was one of those kind of, moments of man i i really screwed up in a way and and not to say that you know (laughs) we we weren't selling the drugs that were in the guy's car Mm -hmm. but put myself in enough positions to take a ride home at two o'clock in the morning from the wrong guy right and sure hindsight when your mom says nothing good happens after midnight (laughs) (laughs) there's a lot of truth to that there's a lot of truth to it (laughs) yeah I, i can really appreciate that you know 
look, you didn't put the drugs there. You, there was a lot you didn't cause to happen, right? It, as far as the the circumstances with that, but it sounds to me like you're taking ownership of placing yourself in that situation and and owning your part of it, right? Um, yeah, of course. So I think that's part did... of growth is to recognize. And I think initially I was pointing the finger, right? Like, well, look at what happened to this guy and look at what happened to this and look who sure. put me in this position. And, you know, it probably wasn't until a couple of years later that I really sat down and, and, and recognized that I put myself in that position. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's, a, I don't want to move on too quickly because that's a critical piece as far as just a, a lesson learned. And, you know, the show is, our show is all about how to overcome adversity and get to abundance. And we don't pretend that that happens overnight. We don't pretend that you snap your fingers and all your problems go away. Um, but as far as getting to that place mentally, it could take years. Right. Um, and so, but I think it's, for me, it's, it's important that, that people understand that, you know, that you, it, it was a process, but you got there and that you kind of take ownership of your situation. Uh, that's just something I want to want to highlight. So, um, now how did those, those years go after that incident? Yeah. So I think what's interesting is after you come out of college, especially, or even after you just finish high school, <clears throat> a lot of us think that we just continue to grow automatically, right? Because mm -hmm. since you go to school from years five to 22, you're quote yeah. growing, right? Because you're going to class, you're learning new things. Um, you're doing new experiences. So I feel like you have this innate belief that you are growing automatically hmm. and then that stops right so now you have to go sure. get a job you have bills um and maybe the growth just turns into work training right right but there's no real personal growth so growth is one of the five core values of our company now and mm -hmm. we hire fire promote and demote based on your adherence to those core values and growth mm -hmm. being one of them means we have to have a growth plan right? What are you doing internally for yourself, not just for the business, right? But yeah. for your marriage, for your health, for, for all these different things, are you sure. growing and how are you doing that? So the first couple of years after school, you know, I was just, I was in, in New York, um, in a sales job, selling payroll and tax filing services. And then I, you know, I bounced around to probably two or three different sales jobs and recognized very quickly that, I didn't really want to work for myself. I um, I was unemployable in the sense that I thought I could do a better job than my managers typically. And that doesn't lead itself to being the best employee, right? Yeah. So you so you did, just to clarify, you did want to work for yourself. You realized, right? Yeah, got it. After after about a year or two, I realized, sure. man, I, it doesn't matter where I go. There's, yeah. there's this drive and desire to just be my own boss. Absolutely. No. And I think this is a critical stage in life for a lot of people who are listening to this show is where you were at that, that point. I know I got out of college and, and I, I had been playing lacrosse in, in school and I've talked about this on some other podcasts, but I, you know, my whole identity was wrapped up in school and, and sports and things. And now what you don't have that right. built in structure to provide the, the growth um, so you've got to kind of, it's on you, right? Um, so that point in time, I think it's very easy for people to kind of drift or just settle maybe is a better way to say it. And just accept that I work my nine to five and I, I, there's no other option. And, and all of a sudden you're 40 as you just turned and you, you didn't go down, you know, it's quite possible you wouldn't have gone down the entrepreneurial path, but, um, so you learned fairly quickly, it sounds like you realized that you weren't a good employee <laughs> and that you had more potential in life to make an impact and, and to grow if you tapped into kind of that, that drive to achieve and, and work for yourself. Is that fair to say? Yeah. And I was good at my sales jobs. I mean, I was hitting quota by month seven, so I knew I could okay. do it. Right. Sure. And then the last five months I'd get to goof off because I wasn't getting paid significantly more to get over quota. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting about what you just said is most people will live their life that way. Most yeah. people will spend that time of coast for the rest sure. of their lives. 
And yeah. that that's the real tragedy, right? Is that yeah. there's probably a desire that keeps people held down. And whether it's golden handcuffs of a nine to five job or just fear of stepping out into the unknown. I, I teach an entrepreneurial class at this um, at this homeschool co-op for kids that are 12 to 18. Right? Okay, and I, that's cool. One of the things that we talk about is the the lie of the world that they try to get you to believe is that it's more risky to start your own business than it is to go work for somebody else, mm -hmm. right? And I just try to ingrain it into these kids that there is no more inherent risk to go into work for yourself than there is to go work for a company. I mean, I know some, I, the guy who was the, you know, head of purchasing for Toys R Us didn't see it coming, right? When Toys R Us mm. went out of business, right? I have, I have friends with biomedical engineering degrees that can't get a job because that became mm -hmm. completely obsolete for one reason or the other. So, sure. you know, I, I think it's important to teach our kids that there is no real inherent, it's perceived, yeah. right? I, I love that. It's, it's great. Fear. Yeah. I just said, I'll just throw in, I, I, one of the recent episodes that just came out on our show was with a guy named James Harold Webb. And it was one of my favorite episodes we've done so far. And he had many crazy stories, um, but I highly recommend the listener go back and, and check that one out. But one of the things that happened to him, which almost got glossed over in his, in his whole story was that he got laid off when he was doing very well and he was sitting pretty. I mean, and the thing is, the company it was doing fantastic. So it, it, but what happened was his company got bought out by a bigger, much bigger company that had their systems and and their scale all, you know, they're, they're, they didn't need his position anymore. So it wasn't a matter of, Oh, I can see the writing on the wall. The company's starting to, to go down, you know, down the drain and I'll just jump ship. No, he had no warning. You got a phone call and said, you're, you're done. And so you never know, right? There really is no, I mean, there's risk. Let's face it. There's risk in entrepreneurship. There's risk in working a nine to five. Um, personally, I like to speak to the fact that I'd much rather uh, wear out than rust out. I'd rather take a, a risk or start a business, have it fail, than, than look back and, and have a lot of regret in my life. So, um, yeah. so yes. Uh, so you, you uh, decided you're going to branch out on your own and, that, and then what happened? Yeah, and the first thing I did was uh, my sister-in-law was opening a real estate brokerage. So she said, hey, why don't you come over here? You basically work for yourself, right? So that sure. was the move from a W-2 to a 1099. I get to control my own destiny, my hours and things like that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and the the franchise that she brought bought into was specifically selling bank-owned properties for banks, right? So okay. they were getting lists of foreclosures in 2006, 7, 8. And we were selling them on the open market. So I got a real good flavor of how I was selling these properties to real estate investors and seeing the mm -hmm. profits that they were turning. And I was making a commission and essentially still working for them, right? Sure. And, you know, doing a, doing a good job of coming up with valuations and finding off-market deal flow and doing all these things and supporting their business. And um, it was at a closing table that I made this guy. He probably bought four or five houses for me that year. He probably made seven or eight hundred thousand dollars in profit from the deals that I presented to him that year. And uh, <clears throat> we were sitting at the closing table, and he said, "Hey, you know, somebody took the pool ladder out of the pool." And I said, "It's a okay. bank-owned property, like you know, <laughs> right? Whatever, like who cares?" Who cares? Yeah, um, sure. And he held my feet to the fire, and he would not close until I took the two hundred and fifty dollars out of my commission to wow. pay him back for a pool ladder. And I went home that day and that was the day that I decided I'm going to go flip houses <laughs> nice. and I'm going to burn the boats and I'm going to go and I'm going to do what these You're guys all in. Yeah. I have the ability to find deals on the MLS. I know that I could, you know, get this many deals to support my lifestyle. And, and that was, that yeah. was the so you're, you're pointing to your strengths and, and your experience already. Uh, and then the thing is like, if you'd tried, couldn't you have gone back to becoming a, an agent again? If you yeah, tried never, and failed to do your flipping business and that didn't work. Yeah. I mean, you I, think a, I, I think I finally let my lap, my agent's license lapse like three or four years ago. So yeah. I kept it for seven or eight years, not because I thought I'd go back, but because I needed access to the MLS to find deals. Sure. It supported your, your investing, your new right. venture. Um, but again, you know, 
it's not like this is the end all be all. And if you're flipping business just dries up, you have no other options. Yeah. You could yeah, still I, do I've what you're doing. I've been asked this question a lot, right? I think a lot of people ask, well, how did you go about and do it? And mm -hmm. I have friends in this business that have done it completely opposite of me and the same as me. But to say that it's all or nothing is a personality trait, I think, thing. So I sure. have some friends who worked at W2 and slugged away a bunch of money until they had a year reserves in the bank. And then, then, yep. then they knew that they could go and start investing and doing these other things. <clears throat> That is not how we did it, right? Travis and I, <laughs> my business partner and I flipped, we wholesaled one house. We made $16,000 on it. We recognized that this could work. Sure. We took $8,000 each and went to Costa Rica. This was before we had kids. He wasn't married yet. I was married. My wife and I went down there to meet. He went to Costa Rica for a month to surf and I went for a week to hang out. And it was that it was on that trip that we decided life's too short to work for anybody else. Let's go home and burn the boats. We had no safety net. We had no savings. Uh, that's not for everybody. Right? Sure. I don't yeah. I don't suggest that for everybody. But for us, we knew that there was no Plan B, right? Which is what we mean when we said we burn the boats. Yeah. Um, we weren't going back to anything else. This was going to work, and we were going to figure out a way to make it work. I now, how quickly that. we made that happen. Probably longer than I want. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I know, you know, for my, for me, I was able to just, we had different circumstances and I was able to, I went part-time. I worked for uh, the department of defense because I'd been in the army before and it just, it kind of one thing led to another. I ended up going part-time in 2015, was able to, for seven years to work part-time as I built up my real estate business, as I built up my mortgage note business, yeah. because that made sense given the circumstances. Yeah. Um, so I think that's great. I mean, you know, people like to argue what, should I have a side hustle? Should I go all in? It depends. Depends on your personality. Depends on depends your circumstances. On you. yeah. Depends on the goals, you know, all that stuff. So, and I mean, if I had to do it all over again with three kids and a mortgage, and you know, I, it would be different. Sure. Right? But Absolutely. I had a wife who fully supported me. We had a one bedroom apartment, not a lot of bills. And we were like, look, I mean, in the do beginning, this. we, in the beginning, my wife and I would even go and do like um, brand ambassador type things, right? Where if you've ever gone to a place and you have like the girl passing out beer or the girl like taking pictures with guys and mm -hmm. giving out samples and stuff like that, like we would go and do that. I'd get paid like 17 bucks an hour. They'd pay her 30 bucks an hour, but we'd be together and we'd go do these things on the weekend just to pay the bills if it wasn't work so like you know you, you figure out stuff to do when you don't sure. have overwhelming responsibility absolutely you're resourceful so then um i do have a some questions i'm going to fire off but but take us from kind of that point up through today before we get to those questions yeah so when we started the business we started wholesaling and you know it took four or five years to ramp that business to 15 deals a year, which was a lot of work for just the two of us and not a lot of money. We frankly took a pretty significant pay cut and we just really didn't know what we were doing uh, wrong. I mean, so we started listening to some podcasts mm -hmm. and started listening to some guys who were saying that they were doing a hundred flips a year. And I was like, that's baloney. I don't believe that at all <laughs> because I know how hard we were working Sure. And we weren't getting to scale. So we called those guys and we said, Hey, how are you doing that? Mm -hmm. And one of them had a mastermind group that I don't know, I think we paid $22,000 for that first year. We couldn't afford it. We convinced them to take it on four separate $6,000 payments across the year. Mm -hmm. Um, but we just knew that getting in this room of other people that were doing this high level business Mm -hmm. would be beneficial. Sure. So that next year we did 78 deals. Wow. And then the year after that we broke 120. Um, yeah. And then we were doing 15, 20 a month. And that's what, where <laughs> we started the story, which was, okay, now yeah. we are paying a lot in taxes. It's highly transactional. There's a lot of turnover in the business <clears throat> and essentially we built what I now consider the the wrong widget um, just for our personalities and what we wanted to do. So, you know, it, sure. it was a good business. We learned a lot about how to create and start and frame a business. And then uh, 
once we started paying significantly less in taxes and getting passive cash flow, we were like, oh, <laughs> let's just go this moment. way. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, as far as the the mastermind group, I know you and I are in a, another mastermind as well. Um, you know, people, some people like to sit on the outside of these groups and say it's a waste of money. And, and I think it can be depending on the group, but you probably made up for your $22,000 in one deal, I would guess. Right. And um, so what I've never sat down to quantify how much we've spent in these mastermind groups and what it's done for our return on investment, because now mm -hmm. it's almost infinite. <clears throat> you you can't even quantify it because mm -hmm. one really strong relationship mm -hmm. can change the trajectory of your entire business. I mean, I can tell you that multiple times at these events, I've sat around and gone and grabbed another cup of coffee and mm -hmm somebody will give me a million dollar idea in passing that's normal for them, but we haven't applied to our <laughs> life yet. And it's just sure. mind, blowing mind blowing because they're yeah. like, they're speaking so nonchalantly about this. And it's like, no, that's wait, say that again. Re tell so, me again how that looks. So, so can you point to, I know we're not, you, you can't quantify it, but how did that particular mastermind group improve your, your flipping business? <clears throat> so one, I think it's getting around like, you know, we, people always talk about the four minute mile, right? Nobody broke the four minute mile. And then all of a sudden one guy did. And like three other people broke the four minute mile that year because the mental barrier was broken that that mm -hmm. was an unachievable goal. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> similarly, when you get into these masterminds, when you're starting out, mm -hmm. you see all these other people getting the results that you want to get. And sure. they can give you the blueprint of how to get there mm -hmm. in a much shorter period of time. So- yeah. You know, I, the people that never join these mastermind groups and have something negative to say, it's interesting because you'll never find those people inside the group that are writing the 25 or 50 or a hundred thousand dollar checks, right? right? You're Absolutely. only finding those naysayers on the outside. And I, I decided a long time ago to stop taking money advice from my broke friends. So <laughs> I don't. That's great. I love it. That's really good. So I'm going to fire off some questions and then we can talk more about your, your current business, uh, uh at the end of the end of the episode, what's one thing that people misunderstand about you? I think um, because I'm a visionary, I think I, so. Thank God I have an operator business partner because I'm a mm -hmm. I'm a visionary guy, and, and I think it could come off sometimes as um, aloof, like because we're not super tactical in the operations. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> At least that's not how my brain processes things. Mm -hmm. My whole team does that, right? So the the, the process is very succinct and tight. Mm -hmm. um, but I think about me personally, I think people hear big vision, big dreams, big goals, and they think tactically it's difficult to execute on that because operationally it's um, not how my brain works. Sure. Um, but makes sense. You know, I, I think that I've done a really good job of surrounding myself with the people that are really good at that to make sure yeah. that that doesn't fall through the cracks kind of the the who, not how. And the reality is you probably wouldn't be, if you were drawn into those tactical, all those in the weeds decisions, you likely wouldn't have the mental space to excel where you should be excelling, where you are excelling. I, um, that's, that's just a guess. Um, if you could go back and give your 18 year old self some advice, what would it be? Besides um, don't call shotgun. Yeah, don't call shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I accepted Christ into my life about 17 years ago, and I think that um, that has made a huge difference in in my life, um, having a, a real relationship with God. So I, I, I think I'd say the first thing that's important to tell my 18-year-old self is that um, God is real, and he loves you, and that will make all the difference when you find out why that's real to you. Sure. That's really good. Um, if you could have coffee with any historical figure, who would it be? Mm. That's good. Um, you know, I, I love, have you watched uh, the men who built America? No. It's a good? history, history channel, like mini series. Okay. And it goes through, um, the Rockefellers and Carnegie's and mm -hmm. like the oil boom and all that stuff. And man, I'll tell you, I think the entrepreneurship in the men who literally built this country would mm -hmm. 
would really make me um, inspired. And I have a mm-hmm. ton of questions as to why some of them failed and why some of them really succeeded. So probably the Rockefeller Carnegie era type entrepreneurs. Sure. Um, you know, I good. think my, my answer for that used to be Jesus, but I get to meet him when I'm dead. So I don't need to go back and have <laughs> coffee. With him. Yeah. Well, and it, look, it's just one person. It doesn't have to be your favorite. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's a good answer. So now how about if you were given $10 million, not for your fund, but for you personally tomorrow, what would you do with it? So our big, hairy, audacious goal in the business and personally is to give 80% of our income away. Um, okay. And that means that we'd have to give a lot of it away. But I think strategically more than just giving 80% away, it would be to find a way to invest that money through a donor advised fund or a nonprofit so that it would continually kick off cash in the future for a hundred year legacy plan. So outside of me, if Mm -hmm. I'm dead, how does the donor advised fund continue to give money away? Um, So I think that that would be the first thing I would really try to figure out how to do is how do we create that 10 million and make it a hundred million so that we could continually give uh, in perpetuity after we're gone. I love it. That's great. What are some of the uh, nonprofits that you, that you give to now? Uh, So I think there's um, at this point over 70,000 lives affected through 23 or 24 different nonprofits that we've supported Hmm. and they vary from, uh, the Field of Dreams, which is an amazing handicapped accessible um, park in New Jersey that you know was partially funded by um, Todd Frazier for a baseball field from the Mets. And there's bocce and basketball and handicapped cool. accessible everything there. So my my uh, my late brother was severely mentally handicapped and in mm. a uh, group home for most of his life. So that mm. was a big cool project that we got to support. Um, that's cool. We've pulled girls out of sex trafficking in, uh, mm. Ukraine, uh, you know, living in a basement mm. with special forces guys that we were able to fund. Um, wow. we, we filled a 757 on Bagram, uh, air force base the day that the Afghani air force base got shut down of, of mm. Afghani refugees that mm. were going to be political prisoners and assassinated likely. So we were able to send the fuel to, uh, to that plane, We've dug, dug some wells in Africa. We've done some things here, um, you know, to support hmm. moms with uh, unplanned pregnancies and to give them the support and um, some baby showers and like a year's worth of baby goods in the beginning of the, their baby's lives. And so a lot that's of awesome. different things, um, you know, yeah, that's we, great. there's no shortage I, in the world. So, yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, I just love getting that, that type of message out there that, entrepreneurship and small business can actually be a, a force for good. And, and I, I believe that it should, should be. be and that it is yeah. in general, but um, you know, so it's fantastic to hear that you, you're not some successful, greedy, you know, uh, small business owner, real estate investor who just sits back and, and uh, counts all his, his pennies. Um, I had a uh, Mc, Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I had a um, Brittany Turner, on the show and she she would uh <laughs> she actually bought an island uh recently in the british virgin islands and she she did a lot of that uh, um it's things i just frankly had never even thought to do but you know rescuing um uh, you know uh, females from sex trafficking uh operations in the ukraine and other parts of the, the world her i guess her husband in a, is a former special forces guy and they have a network where they can go in and and do that and it's like that, that's amazing. <laughs> so that's, that's, it is kudos to you for, for doing that. And it sounds like you're not stopping and you have a much, you know, you, you want to grow what you've got so that you can make an even bigger impact. So I think it's fantastic. Um, let's, uh, how about more industry related? What's, what's one uh, struggle that you're dealing with in your business right now? <sighs> You know, I think finding good deals at pencil is always an issue in a retraction, right? Which we're clearly in. Um, so as 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 we're a fund and we fund other operators, experienced operators, I think the biggest challenge right now is to make sure that the underwriting is on point, um, which is why we only invest in operators that have at least 10 years experience, at least a billion under management. Like we're not funding newer operators and there's mm-hmm. no shortage of them. You know? <laughs> sure. Um, 
which I wish them all the best. It's just not something that we can fund because yeah. in this interest rate environment and this inflationary season, you have to be pretty dialed in as to how to hedge against those downside risks. Absolutely. So yeah. that's that's been our biggest focus right now. Got it. And so just to be clear, you you because you mentioned you have your partner is more operational focused. You you inside your fund don't operate um, directly. You you uh, raise capital and then find well seasoned and experienced successful operators to place that capital with. Is that correct? Yeah. So we have an in house asset management team and we manage the managers to the plan essentially. So we don't deal with the day to day property management uh, yeah. issues but we manage the asset management team. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah and I do think that the, the operator is the key. I mean, finding, doing your due diligence. I'm not, I'm not speaking to you. I'm speaking to the listener out there. If you're going to place capital with someone, finding someone who knows what they're doing is, is so much is the no, number one key piece because they're going to make the day-to-day -day decisions. And there's an element of, of trust and that you, you, uh, can't control everything. So to me, that's the most important factor, even when compared to market conditions and the deal itself and that kind of thing. So, um, what's, um, one thing in your, your field of expertise or your business that almost no one agrees with you about, <laughs> I don't think I've asked this one before, so I'm trying it out. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I think first is that um, <laughs> overwhelmingly we, we compete with Wall Street because Wall Street is typically who's writing the check to the institutional operator that we partner with. Mm. And I would say that they don't agree with us on much in terms <laughs> of how the investor needs to take priority. So <clears throat> REITs historically return five, six to eight percent. On mm -hmm. Wall Street, and the reason is, is that they're actually getting six, fifteen to twenty percent per annum returns from the operator, but they arbitrage all of that income back into quote the cost of the fund. Mm -hmm. So there's just a lot of pork in it, right? There's a lot of fat, and mm -hmm. we run a real lean, mean team. Our fund mm -hmm. actually isn't a profit center for us. So mm -hmm. unlike most funds that operate, mm -hmm. we don't take any income from it. We take income by partnering on the general partnership side, which means our preferred investors get paid first mm -hmm. and we don't make any money until they make that obligated return, which mm -hmm. is different than I think a lot of the industry does it. Uh, mm -hmm. There's always a preferred return in some level of the limited partnership, but it's mm -hmm. usually at like the four to 8% range. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> everything over that is kind of your risk capital. And we structure it for accredited investors at a 12 floor and go up mm. from there. Okay. And we don't eat until after that is achieved. <clears throat> and because we're not arbitraging what the fund does, it's really our obligation to make sure that us and the manager are outperforming or performing to pro forma to make sure that we're hitting our own metrics because we're sure. the ones at most risk. I gotcha. And you're, it, it helps align the interests of your interests with the, the passive accredited investors interests. Yeah, most of the time it's like, hey, if we only make, you know, a million dollars, right? And you have eight hundred thousand in, <clears throat> it'll usually go eight hundred thousand back to you, and then we'll split the profits dollar for dollar, right? A dollar to you, a dollar to me, a dollar to you, a dollar to me until the money's gone. So if we were projecting fifteen percent and you only made eleven, that's on you, right? Mm -hmm. Our fund actually has a clawback provision in it to where if you make, if I make money and you haven't achieved your 12, you can claw it back from another deal inside the fund from me. Hmm. Right. So that's, okay. it's, it's very different um, sure. in terms yep. of, and, and it puts more risk and more onus on us, but that's why we wanted to create it that way. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. Um, what's a, a book or two that you could recommend for our listener? <sighs> January 3rd, Atomic Habits has to be one of them. Um, Love it. Yeah, if you're great. looking to do the new year, new you thing, it's not about the result. It's about the habit. And sure. I know this because my alarm went off at five and I went to the gym mm. and I was like, yes, I'm nice. doing it. Awesome. So, yeah, James, <clears throat> James Clear is great. I, I need to reread that one. Yeah. And it's he really was good. just on School of Greatness too, on the podcast School of Greatness. He, he did a, a great job with uh, nice. Lewis Howe just talking about, you know, how those things intertwine into um, into the new year. Yeah. And then um, Entrusted 
is is frankly a, a great book. It's about legacy planning and how to incorporate yeah. your children into legacy planning. So <clears throat> one of my quarterly rocks last year, and it's going to bleed into this year, is the 100-year legacy plan for my family, for my business, and for my donor-advised fund. Nice. And um, I think a lot of people are, you know, we talked about it a little bit in this uh, episode too, like do, do wealthy kids have problems of their own in terms of being yeah. lazy or being entitled and hi buddy sure. yeah and that's how we that's my son he's joining us for this one so yeah absolutely um, no i love it and and speaking of legacy and kids right it's perfect timing um i actually have that book on my my uh right next to my bed ready to, ready to yeah i just haven't started oh it man it's gotta, good gotta get through some others yeah Nice. But I would say that that in terms of legacy planning, that really helps you figure out how to pass that stuff on to your kids in a healthy way. Absolutely. I love it. So as we wrap up here, Stephen Libman, uh, how can our listeners reach out to you? Where can they find you online? Yeah. So if you go to investingwithpurpose.org, you can see the nonprofits that we're helping. You can partner with us. You know, as an investor, you're you're partnered with us, right? Because the money that we give away through the website or through the donor advised fund is not, um, it's, it's after the investor returns. So that comes out of our pocket, but you get to partner and take, uh, take ownership of that blessing as well. So go to investingwithpurpose.org. You can find us on any of the social media sites, but, um, that's the easiest way to partner with us. Love it. And what's the, uh, the name of your podcast? Investing with purpose. You can find us on anything that podcasts are released on. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Stephen, I'm not going to review everything that we've uh, talked about, but I, it was a lot. Some, it was a lot. We covered a lot of ground. We covered a lot of, about instability in, in the formative years and then, you know, taking ownership of your own decisions and, and um, you know, you've, you've certainly dealt with uh, adversity for sure. And you've found a way to abundance um, and we appreciate the, the, I really appreciate this, just the, uh, the fact that you are, out there making a positive impact on the world and, and, um, you know, operating with integrity and, um, making a, a positive name for entrepreneurship and small business and real estate investing. So thank you so much for, for joining us. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jamie. And to the listener out there, please, uh, give us a positive rating and review. If you can, if you enjoy the show, feel free to reach out to me, Bateman James at labradorlending.com. And we appreciate you for spending your most valuable resource with us. And that is your time. Thanks everyone. Take care.